Yeah, this morning I'm going to talk about uh, Maria Erminia Antola de Gomez Crespo, an interview that my co-author Hector Garcia Martinez did. I'm going to be reading from Volume 4 of Annotations for the History of the Classical Guitar in Argentina, 1822 to 2000. It's a four-volume uh, book that weighs 21 pounds. It's available for $300, shipping included worldwide. This is an interview with Maria Erminia Antola by Hector Garcia Martinez in October of 1996. We're in the home of the maestro Maria Erminia Antola, distinguished maestro of the guitar and wife of the celebrated composer and guitarist as well, Jorge Gomez Crespo. Jorge Gomez Crespo was a good friend of Andres Segovia. He was the first person to get a phone call every time Andres arrived in Buenos Aires. Hector Garcia Martinez, maestro, I would like you to tell me how your vocation for music and the guitar started. How did you approach it, the first contacts you had, and what motivated you? In reality, the musical part of my life commenced at six years old with the piano. My mother played the piano as well, and I was always playing those things that children do, pretending to be the concert artist to be seated there in front of the keyboard. Then she decided to try to see if I had some aptitude. I appeared seated in one of her slips and she had me play a famous piece of the time, El Carnavalito. And she saw really right away that I could do a little bit. Another day she took me to a conservatory of a very good professor and there I commenced to study the piano. I want to say with that, that my musical vocation that I had was when I was very young and besides I had the fortune to have musical parents. My mother played the piano well, sang very well and had studied singing and my father as aficionado played the piano. He had studied with Juan de Dios Filiberto, author of the famous Porteño song Caminito of world renown. Filiberto had been a student of Alberto Williams, great Argentine musician and teacher, something that many people don't know. That is to say that he had seriously studied the piano. So there, those were my beginning approaches to music. But very painfully, my mother died when I was just eight years old. You have to view the situation of a widower of 39 years old with four children to see the crumbling of the entire home. This motivated my father that when I turned 12 years old, he thought seriously to reawaken my musical studies and he himself asked me, do you like the guitar? Because it is a very beautiful instrument, very simple. Great, I inclined myself towards the guitar. Sadly. The first three years learning were bad with a person that didn't implant a school or anything by his style. My father had to hire due to fortunately finding Justo T. Morales. He came to my house and I and said all I had been doing was wrong and that I had to start all over again. I was very obedient. In that moment I was 15 years old and what I did had a very good result. He saw my predisposition to study. He demanded much of me. That means to say that in a year, I worked the miracle of getting rid of all of my defects that I had. And not only did I do that, but he created a duo with me. We played as a duo on the radio for months and months. Then the same Professor Morales that was providing my musical education joined a quartet that can be said as to have made history because I am speaking of many years ago that involved logically him, Bianco, Bianchi Pinheiro, I, Elsa Mar Molina, who was a great player. Sadly, those artistic life, whose artistic life was cut short due to bad luck of an infirmity, arthritis, 
what made those prodigious fingers that she had come to a stop because she had a very brilliant execution, the most difficult part of the instrument that she dominated totally, and that she had to give up. So then in that moment, we had a quartet that performed a lot, logically without a great broadcasting, but it was also very positive for me to learn and share with others. In the end, I always think that those little groups made much of the education of the student. Afterward, I studied with Consuelo Maya Lopez. Consuelo was a great professor. At that moment, she was giving concerts, actually concerts that were very important. You can see videos of Consuelo Maya Lopez, I believe from the early 1970s, where she's playing uh, along with students on YouTube. Great stuff. She was a Pratt student. I remember, for example, that one dedicated to Bach, something that I never saw another guitarist repeat. In 1934, Consuelo Maya Lopez did a complete three-set J.S. Bach concert. And after studying with her extensively, because I studied privately with her five years, in one moment she thought about starting a duo with me. We had a great act, including important places such as Teatro Odeon, Teatro Cervantes in El Circolo in Rosario, Santa Fe province, that always was of importance to perform there. She was an excellent professor. We studied very conscientiously, thoroughly. That motivated a composer of ours who is sadly forgotten, Alfonso Galuzzo, who would write many works for us. Possibly the reason why he didn't have extensive fame was because he wrote in a classical manner and logically there are people who resisted that which is to say they would write folkloric pieces which was the music of the period of time but fine that was his manner to compose and he composed many good works I must say very difficult we studied them thoroughly to the point we gave a concert and used sheet music we always performed our programs memorized I remember we did a homage to Soar with respect to the date of his death. All of Soar's great works were performed. Lastly, it was a very beautiful season, really. That was during the epoch in which I studied with Consuelo Mayo Lopez. Then my father said, you are already giving concerts. The artist has to express the same, and you have to take the determination to do those things yourself. I must say that in a given moment I had the support of Maestro Gilardo Gilardi, great Argentine musician, with whom I had studied harmony privately. Those contacts are always grateful for the people who study. I'm reading from page 2507 of my book, Annotations for the History of the Classical Guitar in Argentina. 1822 to 2000. To be in contact with those who have great knowledge, as in the case of Hilardo Hilardi, who I always had a great admiration for. Then he said, my father, you have to take the determination to be you. You can't follow that course. Here's a picture of the teacher who taught her harmony, Hilardo Hilardi. This is from the Magazine Orfeo Revista Musical, issue number 39, fourth year from July of 1921. With the concerts you have given, doing what a professor tells you, I considered that he was right. He said, if you err, you have to be you. If they do your good reviews, they are behind the hand of a professor. I always said all my life with all the professors I have studied with. The one I have not named is that who ruined me from the start. We've always stayed in good relations with Consuelo. She understood it. That more or less coincides with the epoch in which I met Jorge Gomez Crespo. With him, what we had was a relation as colleagues. My father was a friend of everything artistic. He liked having reunions on Saturdays, which drew those restless artists. 
They would they could be intellectuals, etc. I remember that there he made the acquaintance of Melissa Zini, who afterward became a great actress, one of the most highly acclaimed. Melissa Zini was a friend of mine. She was named Maria Luisa Zambrini. She was the niece of a great ear, nose, throat specialist, the Dr. Zambrini. She studied in the National Conservatory as professor she had. Alfonsina Storni, great Argentine poet, and Blanca de la Vega. Melissa was one of the young actresses, perhaps with more culture. Besides, if she wasn't the first, she was one of the first to recite Garcia Lorca, and that she did very well. Then when my father held the reunion, she would come and other personalities. They were reunions without pretensions. Consuelo, Mayo Lopez came, Galuzzo, persons who also were in the picture, and that helped me besides to relax while playing. And there I began a cycle of important concerts. There Jorge Gomez Crespo had been coming and ended up giving me the Serie Argentina. It was the first time the National Commission of Culture, which eventually became the equivalent of the National Foundation of the Arts now, had given a prize to a work for the guitar. It was a great satisfaction because I had given its debut. I should clarify at the time that we were not a romantic couple. I simply liked the work very much. But I believe that when he began to come to my house, he already had come with his intentions. You have to say the truth, and she laughs. Here's a picture of Maria Erminia Antola de Gomez Crespo with her husband sitting in the background. She's playing a Velasquez guitar. Velasco guitar, excuse me. We ended up being a romantic couple. We got married, then they said, you studied with him? No, I didn't study with him, I responded. But every time I gave a concert, I said to him, fine, sit down, Jorge, and see how it appears to you. And he would give me his impression. In general, we coincided a lot and happily in the other part, in the conjugal besides. Well, I was married to him for 28 years and previously two years as his girlfriend. We were very happy. We understood each other and fine. Afterward, our children were born. Next, I was named to the Cathedra of the Guitar in the National University of La Plata, province of Buenos Aires. That would be the uh, department head for the guitar department at that university. In what was then the Escuela Superior de las Bellas Artes, which later converted to the Faculty of the Arts, which is something that we owe to Buenos Aires because La Plata has always beaten us. It's been years since they had the Faculty of the Arts. I commenced to go there and I had the luck to create many students who are relevant to the music scene today, such as Guillermo de Feo, whom I just received a postcard sent from Zurich, who was performing in Europe. All of the young players then, who are not young now, the guys who are 40 years old that are giving classes in the Faculty of the Arts in the Conservatory Provincial de la Plata, the majority of them began in my Cathedra of the Guitar. I had it first the basic cycle, afterward I believe the special bachelor's degree. The first in South America was there in La Plata, a very complete bachelor's degree because of its university uh, character, like the National College of Buenos Aires were first referring to the National College of Buenos Aires Junior High, but a university, but with a university character, but with the artist's aspect added. When I believe it was practical and musical, meaning the students studied their bachelor degree, such as they had to study all the added materials, a few of ceramic arts and others of music. From there, they left with an extraordinary formation, because including the students of ceramics who were obligated at least while I was there, I don't know if there had been any changes in this aspect. 
to have also materials in league with music and the musicians materials in league with ceramics. That be, means that the bachelor's degree that came from there was very complete in its formation. The sculptor knew who were Debussy, Beethoven, and Bach, and at once the musician knew who were Manet and Toulouse-Lautrec, etc., some of those great painters. I thought that at one time, if I lived in La Plata, I would send my children to school there because really it would make a complete preparation for the educating of them. That motivated the work of my obligations to ta be taken very seriously because I had the satisfaction that in an election held in the university, my colleagues in the Department of Music elected me unanimously. The votes appeared after I think that a combination had been done because it was quite something that there weren't any dissent. There wasn't any dissent. From the root of that, I was in that position for almost eight years. That had me completely occupied and I backed off of my very demanding practice that I had to do to perform concerts and was motivated to dedicate more of my effort towards teaching. And what also happened to us women that have the conscience of a mother. You have to be dedicated to your children, to your husband, and to the home. I backed off from that in this respect. All of us know that to give conscience, you have to study a quantity of hours daily that I evidently didn't possess. Hector says, and travel? Maria speaks. I travel during those epics four times a week to La Plata but I have a remembrance very extraordinary. I had nothing more than to come upon it. I had the fortune to organize great concerts because of the body of professors was mixed with the greatest musicians of our times. There were Hinastera, Lopez Buchado, Hilaro Hilardi, etc. Hector, in the Faculty of the Arts in La Plata, Maria Erminia. Yes, when I entered, I was young. I thought at one time if I lived in La Plata, I would send my children to school there because really I felt a little bit crushed because they were all extraordinary names. There was Duraco, Duraco I called him when I was department head, Carlos Sufer, Ernesto Epstein, Roberto Castro on the piano, Amica Relli, and they were all such figures. For me, it was a very gratifying thing that they elected me as department head, and I was there until 1973. Front door. All right, thank you very much. Need a signature? Thank you. Roberto Castro on the piano, Amicarelli, and they were all such figures. For me, it was a very gratifying thing, and they elected me as department head, and I was there until 1973. Sadly, when their Peronismo returned, the government of Peron, they dominated people that included those who weren't Peronist. Logically, I renounced my position, but he continued as a professor as I had won my position by contest. Hector, pardon, you renounced the Faculty of the Arts in La Plata, Maria Erminia. No, the position is department head of the Department of Music. It was logical. Other authorities came in, sadly, they, there would be reactions that weren't logically, weren't logical, because that came out well with Peronismo or, or without Peronismo. It wasn't a question of politics at all, but everyone was very dedicated to do specifically to what they had been dedicated. Afterward, I kept on with my students and I retired from there in 1980. But previously, when the Juan Jose Castro Conservatory of La Lucila, 
province of Buenos Aires was founded exactly 30 years ago by Maestro Tortorella, who was the creator, the soul of all that. He maintained that for the duration of 30 years, really in a situation of great importance and artistic dignity. In that sense, he was a marvelous director. He told Irma Costanzo he would call me for a professorship. I was there for 23 years. There I also worked very well, forming many students, among them an ex-student who is a great player that I now admire very much. He is Victor Villadangos. You should look for Victor Villadangos on YouTube. A lot of videos. He's a great player. He had a great teacher. And others that don't have the professional presence he has, but nonetheless are virtuosos in their own right. Hector, returning to your epic as a concert artist, I would like that you would tell me when the quartet with Justo T. Morales was formed, what repertoire was used, Maria Erminia. When he formed the quartet, when we formed the quartet with Morales, we played some works of the classical guitar, soar, some things by Carcassi, etc., because there had been a lot of material in Argentine things because you can't forget that Morales was composing well within the Argentine style. Afterward, with Consuelo, we also had the classical repertoire and some transcriptions of contemporary works. We had an extensive repertoire of Alfonso Galuso because he wrote for us, and they were really very beautiful works. When I played solo at first, I played works that were performed all around the world. I played pieces by Bach, Villalobos, Moreno Toroba, and when I was more in contact with Jorge, he began to provide me with some transcriptions that he had done, others by Hilardo Hilardi and Julian Aguirre, and I began to perform Jorge's pieces around the time when I debuted his Serie Argentina. One of the numbers is La Norteña. That was a piece that Segovia recorded, I believe, in the 1950s. Here's a picture of Julian Aguirre, pianist, Argentine composer. And this is from the magazine La Guitarra, issue number four of February 1926. It was published by Maria Luisa Anito's father, Juan Carlos Anito. I don't know if you want me to tell you the story, the history of La Norteña. Hector, please tell it. Maria Arminia, the following occurred. I gave the work its debut for the Asociación Guitaristica Argentina. The widow, the widow of Julian Aguirre had a great affection for Jorge, as he had for her as well. She was a very enchanting woman, very artistic. In her home, she received all the great artists from all over the world. I remember even Victor Malkuzinski lived there for a while. I met Lopez Lagar, great Argentine actor, having tea in her home. She always was telling me an anecdote. When Julian Aguirre died, clearly afterward, many people went to see her, including students of Julian Aguirre. And she told us how they played his pieces, but they never reminded her of how Julian played. One nice day when Jorge was young and just a little more than 20 years old. Someone who was a friend of hers told her, Margarita, I'm going to bring a young man who plays very well, and he has done some very beautiful transcriptions of Aguirre on the guitar. She told me in a letter I have right here in my house that she sent me when Jorge did a homage, and she was in Mendoza and didn't come. She said, I had arranged to hear this young man with all my patience, and do you know what happened? But when he was here and played the works of Julian, I was crying because it was exactly as Julian had played them. Pretty extraordinary, huh? Now look at this extraordinary thing. Jorge had only seen Julian Aguirre perform once, and that was when he was accompanying Brigida Frias de Lopez Buchado. That means he was doing an accompaniment and nothing more. Now, I don't know if it's because the mother of Jorge, uh, my cherished mother-in-law, who was an extraordinary woman who had been a student of Alberta Williams, played a few things by Aguirre, 
It could have been that she also had a friendship with the Professor Aguirre. It, it could have taken place in some way, but it was extraordinary such as it is in this letter I keep right here. Doña Margarita, as she said to us, he made us cry because it was exactly the same as Julian. Since then, she has had a great affection for Jorge. Then when she found out that we were engaged, she said, Jorge, good. Now all those things you have written for them, written them for yourself and nothing more, you're going to send a work to the National Commission of Culture. There is a competition coming up. Jorge didn't want to because he always said the same thing. But if I write those things, I write them for myself. But out of a little respect for her and on the other side as well, maybe that it would leave an impression as we were a romantic couple. It would be nice to see him receive the grand prize. I made certain he sent in the Syrie Argentina and it was the first time a grand prize was awarded to a piece for the guitar at this level. I believe that later Adolfo V. Luna was awarded a grand prize, but until absolutely that moment the guitar had never had been a little forsaken by the hand of God. What occurred? Andre Segovia came here, who had been a friend of my father-in-law, and he had a great affection for Jorge. As soon as he would arrive, he'd dial the phone before he even got, had gotten to his hotel. And also, Carlos Vega was a good friend of Andre Segovia's and also a good friend of Jorge as well. Carlos Vega told Segovia, Ah, but you know that they gave the grand prize to Jorge's work. Segovia responded, very well, I'd like to see it. Jorge hasn't, wasn't moved to bring it to him, but fine, he insisted. Jorge, I had to bring him the work. He brought the Serie Argentina. I thought he was going to at least play something. One day we received a letter, I believe from Bolivia. I'm not very sure where the program and the reviews have been done of this concert where he decided to play La Norteña. I think John Williams also recorded that. There may be a video of that on YouTube as well. It must have been out there for over 40 years. A very special thing happened. I don't know if in some countries it sounded exotic, that work or what it is that happened. But as Segovia played it all over the world, he recorded it on three long play records the first time in London. What happened? It became included in the programs of many players to the point that we started receiving payments every three months from the Society of Argentine Authors and Composers, S-A-D-A-I-C, founded in uh, 1936 on the 9th of July. At times from Greenland, Scandinavia, Japan. Fine, we know that in the last country they really liked the guitar because many guitars have adopted that song. John Williams recorded it, Lopez Ramos as well. Irma Costanzo recorded it recently very well. She as an Argentine knew how to interpret it. Ediciones Argentina's edition of La Norteña published in Buenos Aires in 1949. Here's a picture of the debut version of this. I love collecting all these things to be able to add them to my book. I have over 3,200 images and photos. I spent over $90,000 on the archives to create this book of four volumes, 21 pounds. To continue, that was the history of the famous Nortania that to me continues to be surprising that it still is interpreted in countries like Turkey. I have come to know Ahmet Kanechi, who is the head of the guitar department in the National Conservatory in Turkey. He was there a little while ago in the Guitars of the World Festival. He said to me that La Norteña is a required piece in the study program in the National Conservatory in Turkey. He plays it all the time. That's the history of Nortania. That's a very unusual thing. Hector, let me return to you again. In the conversations we have had, you have told me that your last, that your guitar has been 
in many unusual scenes. For example, you acted with the great stars of the theater, the first full-length film in color done in the country. You were the first female guitarist to appear there. Maria, the interesting thing that happened is for the first time a film was done in color. Hector, short subject. Uh, Maria, in reality it was a newsreel but the director was a man with an artistic sense. Hector, who was he? You know, th that I've forgotten uh, surname, but I have it right here. I'm going to remember a person very valuable to La Plata, province of Buenos Aires, who wanted to make a short subject with an artistic sense, as the short subject was titled El Noticio de Buenos Aires. It was called that. Here's a picture of Maria Erminia Antola playing in that newsreel or small short movie, El Noticio de Buenos Aires. Hopefully someday this is on YouTube. There are very few copies of that that are sitting in Argentina, but uh, things uh, appear from time to time. Maria, yes, it was a newsreel in reality. He wanted to mold all of Buenos Aires in this film. He had the happy idea to begin the film with a reminiscence of the colonial Buenos Aires of 1835, which he filmed in the traditional historic neighborhood of San Telmo. All the women were dressed in the style of that time. How might I say, Catita, comic personality, from Antigua, joking defamation of Manton, Antigua, and the men were logically dressed adequately of the epic. To start, the scene took place in a grand living room of the colonial epic, where the father was and also the mother doing her embroidery with a stretcher. And the little girl of the home played the guitar there. Very beautiful scene, very well done. You saw the photographs. I don't know if they did it in Lumitone, the ambience of colonial Buenos Aires in a large room of the epic. I elected to play a piece by Galilei, a fine old work that couldn't have been played by a girl of that epic. The whole preamble was to show colonial Buenos Aires. A few scenes were shot in El San Telmo, neighborhood of old Buenos Aires, and the girls and boys were dressed in the clothes that were used at the time. After passing through that scene, then to the living room with the girl playing the guitar, all the preface was visualized with the music I played. Whatever was heard was the music of the guitar that I played in the grand living room, even when I wasn't on camera. It was the background music to the film. We finished that scene with an abrupt return to Buenos Aires of that moment, 1941, going a century ahead. It was the first color film in Argentina. Hector, and what appeared and what appeared was a woman guitarist? Maria, yes, yes, in the function as a guitarist. It debuted as all of the films did at that time. I believe it was on a Thursday at the Cine Monumental before a full length film. They presented that short subject. Hector, how long did it last? Maria, I don't remember exactly, but more or less 20 minutes or so. I really can't say. I remember it had a big repercussion. You saw Hector in the critics' reviews I have. It came out in all the magazines. It was what was really happening at the moment. Now I remember the director was named Candido Moneo Sanz, an excellent person that I had met through the friendship of Melissa Zini because he was also a friend of hers afterward. Melissa had a brilliant career, but we always had our great friendship. That was a very beautiful experience. Clearly for me, it gave me the great projection because it was a thing that turned out to be a thing that closed concerts. Hector, in that epic, the guitarist had more access to the mediums of mass communication, no? Which in Spanish, when you say no, it means right? And uh, Maria. Look, in respect to that, it gives me a lot of sorrow when I see the great contrast of how well we were received by the press in that epic. 
and the reception now of the young players today. But sad, it's sad, but for example, I see in the Daily Clarine of Buenos Aires, they dedicate full pages to rock music. I don't oppose it because it's a form of expression, but I don't share in it either. I don't derive any pleasure from listening to rock music. I'm not in the popular musical field. I think there are many things that don't move me. I think it's a music rock that alienates people. Before when there was a Frank Sinatra or Bing Crosby, it didn't occur to anyone to make disasters, something that sadly takes place in the recitals of that genre of music. But you would ask me a question, yes, Hector, about the possibilities of diffusion that the guitarist had, Maria Arminia. In reality, many guitarists, as young musicians of other types, had the support of the press. You had the opportunity to see the quantity of chronicles that I've had. It was a notable amount. The concert date would arrive, and my father, that was a fanatic about his daughter, it happens to all us parents. He would get up real early to see that the great dailies were what the great dailies were saying, La Prensa, La Nacion, etc. As many as there were, it appeared natural to me that four or five reviews would come out. It's not something I might say for vanity, but that really it was extraordinary, and you could see that. There were great critics such as Larocque, Gaston L. Talamon, and others. I had great reviews from them that really gave me the incentive to really follow through my career. Now I observe that there is little response. For example, I have a nucleus of ex-students that are very excellent guitarists among them, is one who performs frequently that it is just the young man I had spoken of before, Viadangos, Victor Viadangos. Look for his videos on YouTube. You will delight in them. Really, he plays a lot and very well. I was in the Escuela de San Telmo a few days ago. He gave a magnificent concert. We're speaking in 1996. Not only for the technique that he has, but completely overcome but with the maturity, he could do anything. And afterwards, there wasn't any clamor, nothing. Because of that, I was taken by great surprise. And I must mention that while there, were, there was the critic Montero, because he gave an extraordinary review in La Nacion with a photo of Viadangos. I believe it was the first few days of August. He gave a debut of a concert of Brower, very important for guitar and orchestra. I told him, you have an ability that no one will say anything. I don't know if the other dailies reviewed it. For me, it was very important to see the enormous importance that the critic Montero gave it in La Nacion, including a great big portrait of Victor Viadangos pointing out for me that he is a great guitarist of the younger generation. Leaving out that, I taught him or I didn't teach him because he has overcome that. Because a few years ago, he stopped his studies with me in the conservatory of La Lucila. He had become very secure and he was developing a personality overall the expressive part that a lot of times the great virtuosos forget a little. Not him, Hector. We'll return to you again. Tell me of your contacts with the artists of the cinema and the theater, Maria Arminia. Yes, I had quite a bit of contact with them and the painters because Jorge, my husband, in reality, he was connected for many years to the painters <coughs> and the writers. He was with them almost more than the musicians because of the painters. It gave the situation that, for example, Larco, Aranaga, Centurion, Emilia Centurion. He did photos in the 20s of Segovia playing for uh, critics such as Martin Heal. You see those photos in our book. That made a splendid portrait. Larco as well. They had reunions in their painters' studios, and it was very common that they made music. Almost all of those painters liked music. He possibly did it easier with the guitar. I don't know. Jorge played a lot in the painter's studios. 
when we got married, we had the opportunity to meet a lot of important figures, including Victor Malasuszynski, I met in the studio of Larco, along with the great orchestra director, Older Wolf, Conchita Abadia as well. She sang for us at the bachelorette party we had in the home of Madden Stephen, that we now call a sponsor, before we called it a host to the artists. Also, she had studied guitar with Jorge. Well, I got a, a little away from the theme. You asked me something specifically. Hector, your relationship with the artists. You shared your guitar with the artists of the theater. Maria, no, I didn't have more than that incursion in the film. After I met Lydia Lemison, that is a great artist of ours. She was a guitarist. Lydia Lemison. Maria Erminia. Lydia Lemison studied guitar with Domingo Pratt. It was there that we met. She eventually gave small concerts. I remember when I was 18 years old, her playing in Casa Nunez that had in the back a little room for the youngsters that had started. She was precious, a blonde with divine eyes, and she played very well. Hector. There was another actress, guitarist, Julia Puigandolis. Maria Arminia. No, I didn't know her, neither Ana uh, Schneider de Cabrera, great guitarist and Argentine folklorist, because I'm a little old, not real old, and then she laughs. They were from previous epics. Hector, didn't you give recitals and shows to the theater? Maria, no, shows in the theater, no. What, in one opportunity they had used was music that I recorded for something, yes, but I didn't act, no. In the beginning, I acted like everyone that started making a part. And for example, I remember the famous chorale of Herman Kumak that I also acted in with everyone sharing that, yes. After how would I say I was connected to the side of the painters by my husband. When they gave the grand prize to Jorge for Serie Argentina, there was a dinner in his homage that I have photos of right here. I believe you saw them at your last visit where there was the reunion of the best of uh, of the best of musicians and painters. Also there was Catulo Castillo, Castillo, great figure of the Argentine tango that was a very good friend of his. Hector, if you were to name two of the great maestros of the Argentine guitar of those epics, what names would come to mind? One, Justo T Maria Arminia says, one, Justo T. Morales, because perhaps he didn't have much fame, but I remember the work he did with me because you know that it's more difficult to correct than to teach. And he succeeded in correctly uh, correcting me completely and that I adopted a school following, I would say, Julio S. Segreras. I started to play for the Ar Asociación Guitaristica Argentina when I was 16. He told me, I'm going to use you for promotion of that which is a good position to hold the guitar. And I laughed and I told him, three years ago you would have used me as an example of how to not hold the guitar. <laughs> because that was the reality. By that, I can't remember, but re I can't help but remember Morales. To me, made me a very good player. After Consuelo Mayo, Lopez was a great professor, very excellent professor. And I know there have been other good professors. I can't forget Domingo Pratt. In reality, it was he who brought the school of Tarraga. He was a little rude in his affairs. He wasn't a person with a very extreme sensibility in that sense of the interpretation. But you have to remember that to him, they were all guitarists that played of the old school, among them Adolfo V. Luna, those that had studied with Manhone, with all those people. And to him, they were to be nourished with the new school of the guitar, because you can't forget that Pratt had studied with your bet, and your bet directly with Tariga. I believe that Pratt had also made some sort of 
incursion with Tariga. They were honest professors developing their labor with a lot of love for the instrument. There were others, for example, Leon Vicente Gascon, that wasn't my professor, but they tell me he taught very well. Alarian Leloup, also Antonio Sinopoli in his moment, to have an opinion based on direct contact. I have the great memory of Morales to this very day. I can say his school was purified, very good, and Consuelo Mayo Lopez, they are the ones I had closest to me. Consuelo Mayo Lopez was a student of Domingo Pratt directly, so I can appreciate that through her he had taught well. Hector, the guitarist at that time had access to recording discs. Maria, the guitarist called classical that made us up, not a lot. I had the opportunity to record a disc, a duo with Consuelo, lamentably. They were things of the type that stayed in my father's home when I got married. For example, I had the tape of my film, and after these family situations, these things became lost. He had brought in a person to take care of my siblings and everything, but it was a service person. It wasn't like having a mother whom would really provide the care of the details of this type. But no, we didn't have a lot of access to recording. Hector, and to the radio? Maria, to the radio, yes. Jorge, my husband, for example, had played quite a bit on the radio. Hector, and you? I also played on the radio a lot. Hector, on what station? Uh, Maria, look, I started on Radio Phoenix. I was 15 or 16 years old. I was very young. My father was saying that I had to play a lot to perfect my ability and after being able to confront larger obligations. Now I'm thinking I was afterwards on several of the other radio stations. On Radio Stenter, just after it began, it was the crest of radio. I was on Florida Ocho, Florida 8, where I played a lot for a long time. When I played a duo with Morales, we played for six months in a row on Radio Nacion. That was the radio of Samuel Yankelovich. He had a building where four radio stations were housed. By that, I possibly met so many people because I was on radio a lot. At the end, I played on Radio Nacional or Radio del Estado. Hector, what great diffusion that the concert guitar was having compared to the present appears like a fairy tale. Did it serve you for them to call you to give concerts? Were you able to live from the concerts? Maria, no, to live from concerts, no. I don't know if I had dedicated to it full time. The defect that our country has is its great extension. Here, overall, in my epic, it was a great entity that was El Circolo of Rosario Santa Fe. It was a badge of honor to play there, where I played a very beautiful concert with Consuelo. After I played in the Asociación Tadaga, I believe you saw something in the albums, but you couldn't live by giving concerts as in other countries. For example, in the United States, there are many states. You can pass from one side to the other, and there are always musical societies that are contracting. But here in this country, I played extensively. But for example, I gave a concert at the Rivera in Darte Theater in Cordoba. I came back to Buenos Aires. Um, you couldn't live like that. And now let me repeat. I gave a concert at the Rivera in Darte Theater in Cordoba, and I came back to Buenos Aires. Afterward, I gave a concert in Mendoza and came back to Buenos Aires with prolonged lapses in between them. You couldn't live like that. And then we fell into the professorships, private classes since the beginning. Like everyone, I had private students after they gave me a professorship in the Fontava Institute where I had done musical study. Here's a picture of Maria Herminia Antola quite a bit later than her beginning years. That is from a 
copy of the weekly magazine, Karazi Karetas, Faces and Masks, uh, magazine from March 4th, 1939, issue number 2109, year 42. Translation of the caption, Miss Maria Erminia Antola, concert guitarist who will soon make an artistic tour of the principal localities of Cordoba. Hector, the concerts paid well. Maria, the concerts overall, the ones I gave paid very well. They weren't really, including when I started. I played a lot for free because, for example, I played for the Asociación Guitarística Argentina or Amigos de la Guitarra. I didn't charge one peso that I did absolutely free. That's what you had to do in the case of a young girl. As it happened to me, a family and a father that had to pay all the bills. We have in my book a lot of the concert programs for the Asociación Guitarística Argentina that began in 1934. Uh, and we have a lot of concert programs for the Amigos de la Guitarra, another uh, classical guitar society group. Hector, as around the time when Segovia came, he performed all over Argentina and charged Maria, but Segovia was a world-renowned personality. He wasn't like us when we started, that we had to be content that the hall had filled up. Hector, when your name had become known, why didn't the same thing happen to you? Maria, yes, I charged, but in a society there wasn't a lot of money. You know that there, the Asociación uh, Wagneriana had never called a guitarist. Because of that inconvenience that the guitarist had, the pianist had more possibilities. Hector, why didn't Segovia have those inconveniences, Maria? No, but when Segovia had already come, including the first time he came, in that epic I didn't hear him because it was Jorge who told me, you know, we went together a few years, many. The first time that he came, he already came with prestige. I must say he laid the foundation right here. Interesting, says Hector, what you say, Maria, to the point that he had a connotation of the intimate type. Segovia was in love with Adelaida. I never met her, but Jorge said she was precious. Hector, she was Cuban. This is the photo of Andres with his very first wife, Adelaida. This is from the archive of Ricardo Munoz. The caption translates to uh, Andre Segovia accompanied by his wife in the garden of their home in Berlin. Maria, no, no, Spanish, his first wife with whom he had his two oldest children, Adelaida, was from the Spanish upper middle class that, you know, that there in that epoch there were great prejudices. I remember my godfather who was Andalusian was in my father's business and he was like an uncle to us. He had told me how his sisters there in Andalusia were middle class with a priest in the family. In the end the sisters became nuns in a convent because you couldn't marry a nobleman and neither was someone from a lower class. Segovia was in love with her and she with him but she was from the upper middle class. She had a romance with a nobleman. At that time, it was terrible. Segovia, they looked at as any guitarist. They looked down on him. They told her, how are you going to marry this young man that plays the guitar, and who is this that plays the guitar? But what happened? He came here, he was such a success, and it resounded to the point that the family of Adelaida looked on him with different eyes and allowed the marriage. Look where the love life of Segovia had a connotation. Hector, it is all a documentary that you are telling me. Maria, yes, his success, Jorge told me all that. In that epic, you can imagine I was going with Jorge when I was 16. So I was a child when Segovia came for the first time. In spite of my mother, thanks to God, having been very musical, he took me to all the concerts. 
I succeeded in seeing Maria Luisa Anito. Here's a picture of Maria Luisa Anito with Miguel Yobet, her teacher. Maria Luisa Anito and Miguel Yobet. Photo is from 1919. This was taken in the Anito home when a series of photos, including Maria, Maria's father, Juan Carlos Anito, Emilio Pujol, and Domingo Pratt were taken. This photo is from the book Maria Luisa Anito by Ercole Ramo Rovieri that he published himself in Milan, Italy in 1957. I give credit to everyone who contributed to uh, my book. I stand on the shoulders of everyone that came before me. Hector, let's return to Segovia, Maria. No, I'd like to tell you when I was a child of six years old, I saw Maria Luisa Nito playing with Miguel Yobet. Segovia returning with a with the aura of a great triumphant artist. He was no longer the poor overwhelmed man with nothing, and so it was that the family went forth with the marriage. Segovia when he came the first time. I believe that detail is well known as I remember. His wife was expecting their first child. The first child of Segovia is Argentinian that is now living in there in Switzerland, I believe, right? Hector, the other one died. Maria, the other one died tragically. It was terrible what happened. Hector, the daughter also died. Maria, the son was 14 years old. He was in a Swiss college as he was accustomed. And I believe also that they kept sending money to keep them in school in Switzerland. He was playing tennis with a friend. The ball went outside. He went out to get it, and there was an electric cable, and the youngster was electrocuted. Segovia had very tragic things happen to his family because his daughter committed suicide. Here's a picture of his daughter, Beatrice. She's the daughter of Paquita Madriguera. Paquita Madriguera was a Enrique Granados student. It's terrible that Enrique Granados played at the White House and six weeks later, later was killed in a, a torpedoing of the ship that returned him to Europe. Uh, Hector, can it be said that Argentina projected Segovia to world renown? Maria, I believe so, according to the things Jorge has told me, because I hadn't seen him. You can imagine that in that epoch I was too young. I don't believe I had started playing the guitar, but Jorge was very involved because my father-in-law was a great admirer of Segovia, and when he came here the first time, he invited him over to have lunch. In the end, he, Segovia, was a man in a situation economically and educationally to have done those things. And yes, yes, do you know what happened? Argentina had a great prestige. You remember those Spanish dancers that later used the names Rosario e Antonio? Hector, no. Here's two pages that are inserted in the middle of this interview. Carmen Amaya had a large troop over 25 people traveled, family members, etc. So nobody stayed at home. They traveled on tour with the musicians. And a part of this troupe was the Rosario and e. Antonio group, uh, female and male dancers. And this, uh, here's the second page of the expose from the late 1930s. These two photos are from the Karazi Corretta's magazine.